at number five, Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. One of my favourite franchises of all time. When Upper Deck announced this game, I was all over it. I already loved the Marvel Legendary game. However, deck building has moved on a little since the original Legendary title. So would there still be enough appeal to get this to the table as a distinct and original game? Designers Ben Sitkowski and Danny Mendel went one better. Not only was it a successful rethink, but they added so much more to the game, especially for the soloist. This is why Encounters has replaced Marvel in my top 10. It's not just about the theme, but the expanded gameplay. You'll be presented with a set of scenario-based objectives, and you'll need to figure out how to beat each one. The scenarios tell you how to construct the decks to use in each scenario, for you'll be using a subset of the cards. Your job during the game will be to purchase and purge cards from your deck in order to develop a deck capable of completing the objectives and surviving against the aliens as they scramble through the ship. The artwork is kind of adult comic book type graphic novel, um, successfully capturing the dark atmosphere of the movies. Most terrifying are the face huggers that leap at you and cripple your card play. More than just legendary in space, more than just a retheme, this is more terrifying and more demanding, and it plays perfectly solitaire. At number four, Lord of the Rings, the living card game from Fantasy Flight Games. If you're looking for a living card game for solo play, look no further. If you're looking for deck construction to play solitaire, then this is the game for you. There are no other contenders. Out of the box, this game was made for you. There's a good chance you'll know the background story, unless you've been living under a stone troll, and an almost equal chance you'll enjoy the theme, popular as it is. There's a wealth of cards to choose from, with monthly adventure packs and larger box saga expansions. Not to be confused with deck building, the game instead uses deck construction, uh, the meta game where you create your play deck from amongst all the release cards and take that into the game with you prior to setup. I.e. you don't have an opportunity to evolve your deck as you play. This means there is always an opportunity to think about the game, tweak your decks, create some new ways to try to defeat the adventures that await you outside of the game. Some adventures are good for cutting your teeth with, like the opening passage through Mirkwood, whilst others are fiendishly difficult, like the escape from Dalgolda. Especially when running just one deck. This is also a cooperative game in which one or two players can take on the scenario together, meaning the soloist can also play two decks alone against an adventure. My challenge has always been to just play one. Like Magic the Gathering, there's often little opportunity to see all cards in your deck in a single play, so there is some art to building your deck without reliance on a few cards. Search the forums and check out the card game database to get deck ideas, and a view as to which expansions you may wish to pick up. This is a well-played and well-loved living card game, and as my number four game, is highly recommended by Box of Delights. At number three, Robinson Crusoe Adventure on the Cursed Island from Portal Games. If a game was ever developed to fit a thematic idea, then this was it. Robinson Crusoe, the name, is used to conjure up an image of what the game is about before you even begin. We all know the man and its story, so immediately we have images of being stranded on a desert island, seeking to find food, making fire, building a shelter. The Robinson theme is short-lived. It merely establishes the preconceptions, cleverly. Once we're on the island, there will be all sorts of mysterious adventures, with a whole host of characters, none of which are called Robinson. We do have Friday, a servant faithful to whoever ventures on the island, but we do have many scenarios that offer us stories, new and old, from rescuing a girl from a raft called Jenny to facing the legendary King Kong. In the expansion, we even get to enact the adventures of Charles Darwin on the ship, the Beagle. The game uses action selection to perform tasks on the island, like exploring for and gathering resources, and later using them to craft inventions like an oven, a map, or perhaps a medicine. Some gamers find the rules a bit sticky, and they can be. They're certainly not as strict and definitive uh, as a lot of gamers are used to. There are some situations that encourage players to assume the correct response, and the way the rules are written can sometimes invite ambiguity. But these are part of the game's charm. Ignacy's intention was to build a game that tells a story, and necessarily asks the players to invest their imaginations into the game and just go with the flow. This game is about having fun with the story, not about mini-maxing an optimal solution from a concise set of rules. The design is one that reaches 
new heights in storytelling. The genius is in the cause and effect event cards, which both drive the passing of time in the game and present the player's choices with consequences. A short-term gain for a potential longer-term consequence. For example, you're tempted with some tasty mushrooms uh, to satisfy an immediate hunger, but this card may now appear later as a poisoning sickness until you can find a cure. This brilliant mechanism means the game gives context to its unfolding story, with the events it throws at you being a consequence of something that happened earlier in the story, not just a sequence of completely random events. The game is challenging, but win or lose, you'll have a bucket full of fun with this rich story and engaging immersion. And number two, Mage Knight board game from WizKids. Let me start by answering the first question. Why isn't Mage Knight number one? Mage Knight is as good as it gets. Mage Knight is the epitome of solitaire gaming. It should be number one. The throne has Mage Knight written all over it. Mage Knight should be wearing that number one crown. It lost it for very little and very personal reasons. But let's no mistake, this is a number two spot on a top 100 list, right? How epic is that? Let me give you the three reasons, and then we can talk about our top two games. The first reason is it just doesn't get as much gameplay as the game sitting at the top. Mage Knight has quite a bit of setup and teardown time, and sometimes this stops me playing it. Secondly, the game in the number one spot wins on production value and love and commitment. Sorry, WizKids. You have a gem here, and it should be coveted. Thirdly, and this was the real decider in the end, if I had to give up one game for the other, I'd let Mage Knight go first. You'd have a fight on your hands, for sure. But having forced myself into a top ten and making a decision, here it is. So what is it that makes Mage Knight such a great game for me as a soloist? I like the glory you get from solving the problems. I love the feeling it gives me to create a solution and see it play out as I planned it. I enjoy the idea of stringing a series of small effects, some on their own, into something that creates an explosive effect in their combination. This is what Mage Knight delights me with. It gives me the opportunity to seek out those magical moments of discovery and invention in the game. It'll throw seemingly unsurmountable obstacles in your way as you explore its depths and challenge you to crush them with your problem-solving mind. Mage Knight offers the soloist the greatest challenge of any other game in this list. The only game that stands in its way is my number one game. The number one game has relatively simple rules. It's more abstract in its play and takes me back to my roots in gaming. And it is, well, let me show you in a moment. At number one, Hoplomarchus from Chip Theory Games. Hoplomarchus is a squad tactics game of arena champions and gladiators competing for glory in the ancient civilizations of Rome, Pompeii, Atlantis, Xanadu and El Dorado, and most recently the Carthaginians and the Huns. If you ask why I play board games over video games, the answer is not just because I prefer the pace of board games, but I absolutely love the tactile experience of a physical board game. And my favourite board game is the most tactile of all, with very little cardboard in sight. It's stacks of weighty plastic chips, the neoprene gaming mats and collection of custom dice all go to make this one of the most sensory experiences in gaming. The clacking of the chips, the tumbling of the dice, and their saltation as chips and dice come together on the bounciness of the mat punctuate a game that gives you the depth of an abstract with the drama of a thematic. The game asks the soloist to take on arena beasts, criminals, bosses, titans and the champions of Rome. In battle reenactments you'll face Hannibal Barca and Attila the Hunt. You'll be fighting for the honour of your royal house and for the favour of the crowd and you'll be fighting for your reputation. Hoplomarchus is actually now a series of games. There's three large box games. The first was Lost Cities featuring the Basuli Arena where gladiators can combat each other for glory in the two-player game, or you can reenact the Venetiones by taking on the arena beasts solitaire or cooperatively with up to three players. A series of three games becoming increasingly more difficult await you and your champion. Draft your gladiators, survive the three bouts to claim your victory. A solo bundle adds this arena, offering up the elephants of Hannibal or the Huns of Attila as your rivals. This sits alongside further mini-expansions, Legends of the Sand, Blade's Edge, my personal favourite, Beast and Master, which sees your gladiators supported by trained beasts such as the Emerald Falcon and the mighty slate-backed gorilla. Next was Rise of Rome, which took us to the Colosseum and introduced the Titans, each driven by its own unique AI, 
giving the soloist a completely new experience with the game, with increasingly challenging opponents more sensitive to the game state. More recently, introducing a series of 20 solo trials, where you must face the champions of Rome in a series of smaller, more intimate arenas, is Origins. This latest set builds on the idea of controlling opponents with an AI script, and once more these opponents become more sophisticated in the way they compete with you to complete the arena challenges, or else drench you in your blood. Rise of Roman Oranges with their devotion to solitaire play are what took this to the game to the top of my list. From the drafting of units to the abstract tactics that will have you mulling over the table, trying different moves and continuations as you seek the plays that will trap your opponent, or mitigate the risks he or she imposes. Finally, with a throw of the dice, the drama unfolds and your analysis of the possible outcomes and the risks you were prepared to take will either reward or punish you. Those moments of high drama are what keep gaming exciting. This game is not a complex brain-burning exercise like chess and it's not an inconsequential random experience. It's a dream to play, a pleasure to own and a luxury every time it gets to the table. That's my top play. I hope you've enjoyed watching this list. Do feel free to leave me some feedback and let me know about what your favourites are. Thanks for watching. See you next year.